more time on other distractions. Um, my context is 2 Timothy 4, 2. It says, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Heavenly Father, thank you once again for this time in your word. I just pray that the word enters the hearts and souls of these folks and it edifies them like it does me and us. And I just pray for this in your son's name. Amen. Now, today, ceremonial baptisms in tongues fit into the distraction category. Um, we know there's at least 12 baptisms in the Bible, and we're baptized by the Spirit. You don't see it, you don't touch it, you don't taste it, you don't feel it, but you can know about it because, you know, it'll, it'll open up the eyes of your understanding. It's an internal thing. And then tongues also fit into this category. There's not one church anywhere in the world that follows one of the six rules as far as speaking in tongues. And the last one is women don't speak in tongues in the church, just men. What would that do to the movement? He says, Paul says, Ephesians 4, 5, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. But Fred was talking about baptism, wasn't he? He's was talking about the water baptism. Who rejected the baptism of John? The religious people. They rejected it. That was the door to, 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 for, for Christ, for the little flock. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, 17, for Christ sent me not to baptize. Now, could Peter and any one of the 12 have ever said anything like that? No, they couldn't. Paul baptized a couple of people, but then he realized he was given this message, and he said, okay, I understand that. The term in Christ is not only a redemptive term, if you go to Romans 6, please, but indicates our identification with him. Romans chapter 6, is a red Christ in Christ is redemptive, and it's our identification identification. Paul says in verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What did it just say in the chapter before this? But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, right? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together, that's a redemption term. It's, it's past tense. You've been planted together. Only time used. In the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection indicating our permanent union with Jesus Christ, which allows us the opportunity, this is most important, to walk in a godly manner. He didn't save us so we could just do what we were doing before that. He wants us to understand some things. Now, when you plant a garden, what do you expect it to do? Grow, right? God wants us to grow today in wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. We planted, our, my garden is growing, still Weeds have been taken over quite a bit, but we got all the onions. We, we, I just harvested my garlic that uh, we planted last year. And, you know, life wouldn't be worth living without garlic and onions. I'm, I'm sorry about that, you know. So we got all these things growing, and we got these uh, not as many fuzzy little creatures. You heard me talking about those little, what do you call it, those chipmunks. You know, cute, but when they start destroying your crop, you get a little upset. They don't look that cute to you anymore. And I, I know I've been on talking about this for a while. And two years ago, I got 40 of them, but I'm down because they're gone away. You know, and I found one of their holes. And, I, you know, the starting fluid you put in your, in your carburetor to get it started? It's got ether in it. So I found one of their holes, and I blocked one and did the other one. I sprayed it down there. Everybody went to sleep. I didn't see any, you know, until about just a few weeks ago. That was an easy way to go. I mean... I'm pounding my chest. I can't stand these guys. I gave them three warnings and they wouldn't listen to me. So, go to Colossians chapter 1 if you would. Colossians chapter 1. And look, you're not alone. Others are sharing the hardships. You know the biggest motivation for people to finish book camp in the Marine Corps? It was tough. What's the biggest motivation? One guy hung himself. Another guy blew himself away at the rifle range. 
How come the rest of us made it? We weren't alone. No matter how few people you think right by the word of truth, we got a group of people right here. You're not alone. Others are going through the persecutions and the sufferings. They're getting older. They're going to die. You know, all these things. You're not alone. That was one single motivating factor that gets everybody through. Except people who want to kill themselves. First Corinthians chapter 12. He says, verse 12, For as a body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. So we're the church, the body of Christ. We're made up of many members. We're supposed to work together. Same chapter, 25 and 26. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer, suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with them. The word schism means a division or dissension. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.10, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, that there be, that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Is there any honor in not knowing the truth today? God wants all men to be saved. And then they come to the knowledge of the truth. Salvation is a gift. You accept it or reject it. It's the next step. It's past that comma. He wants all men to see this. Knowledge of the truth. That includes Paul is the Guy for today, the apostle for today. We're a new church. You can't go back in the Old Testament and search this message out because it was called a mystery. And, it, and only God can keep a mystery as, as a secret, right? Paul says, Romans 16, 17, and 18, I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause division, divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches, deceive the hearts of the simple. They forgot to put in there that they have good clothing. You know, and the eloquent speakers. They have no respect for anybody, you know, older than them. This is a thing that's been going on for a number of years. Rick's wife, Cynthia Jordan. I'm five days older than her. So I demand respect for five days. <laughs> so example one, you're not alone in this fight, in this good warfare. Example number two, being in a war will change your thinking. Guaranteed. How many of y'all's mind been changed that you joined the war? Become a soldier. Has it changed for the better or for the worse? I never really understood this until after I got saved when I started learning about our conscience. In a shooting war, not the one I'm talking about, you're thinking your conscience will change and not for the better. In this war, Paul says the following. Romans 2, verses 14 and 15. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and the thoughts the mean while accusing or else excusing one another. In grade school, the Bible, we go to this verse in the first year, I was absolutely thrilled when I saw this verse. Everybody knows when they're doing wrong, right? Isn't it written on their hearts? Everybody knows they're, when they're doing wrong. Is that true? For a while, I'm starting to think, well, all these people, they want to kill you because you don't believe exactly what they believe. You don't, you know, um, they must know that on some certain level, right? 
What about a mob mentality, groupthink? What does that do to the person's conscience? You with me on that? Paul says, Romans 12, 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. First Timothy 1, 5, Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. So I'm dealing with this word conscience. Here's the types of conscience you can have. You can have a pure conscience, a good conscience, a weak conscience, a defiled conscience, a weak and defiled conscience, and an evil conscience. Remember when John, or when in, in the earthly ministry of Christ, that woman was caught in the act of fornication? And all the Jews standing around, well, she ought to be stoned. What did Christ do? Did he point a finger at her? What did he say? If you, don't have any, if you don't have any sin, go ahead and start stoning her. Well, at that time, people still had a conscience. Even the Pharisees, they were there. But there was still something missing about as far as conscience that I, that I needed to learn. Um, my first day in Vietnam was March 13, 1969. I turned 19 in June. In July, I was out somewhere, and it was dark, it was jungle. jungle. He started taking fire. There's a gunnery, gunnery sergeant right here. All right. He didn't like me. I started to take cover. He had 45 on me. He says, if you move one muscle, I'm going to kill you. True story. What did I do? Well, within a split second, I stood there because he has a point-blank range. The other people were shooting. I was hoping I wasn't going to get hit, but it was dark out. Evidently, I survived. How do you think a teenager Marine, fully locked and loaded, might have felt about this gunnery sergeant? How do you think? Talk about hate, vengeance. I started thinking about that when I did this message. And in war, life is cheap. In war, one gets hardened depending on how much you've seen and experienced. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Again, I made the decision in probably less than a second. And the shooting only went on for about a minute. I can tell you that from that point till, the, till right now where I'm standing here, no other minute has been longer than that minute. Did you know they don't do ballistic tests in the war? If I'm laying there with a hole in my chest, they're not going to see if it's a 45 caliber or it's from the AK-47. It's just another bullet hole. Dag him and bag him. 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. How come he didn't shoot me? I don't know. Please don't ask me. I don't even remember. But he didn't shoot me. The word seared here, it's the only time it's used. There are many phrases and words exclusive to Paul. It means... To burn, to brand, to burning to the point of no feeling. You're insensitive, like thick scar tissue. So I'm thinking, okay, this is our mind, our spirit, and down here is our heart, about 18 inches in between. And 
between there, between your mind and your heart, you can build up some scar tissue as far as sensitivity. And the more you do something that's against God, the less you think about it and the less sensitive you are to it. And it's hard to get somebody out of that, but you can't come out of that. But you don't care anymore. You see people getting hurt. You see all this death and mayhem, and you're part of that. This is where we are at right now in the world. I want you to go to Colossians 3, please. We're at the end of another 500-year cycle. We are in the winter time period, fourth turning. The winter time period in history is when you have a major war, not something like Korea or Vietnam. And we're in this situation right now. Does everybody agree with that? You understand that? And what does God tell us to do? Colossians 3.15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. What? <laughs> I'm supposed to be peaceful in the midst of all this, and I'm supposed to thank you too? God wants all men to be saved, comma, then to come to the knowledge of the truth. Does everybody here consider themselves a good soldier? Can I see by your hands, how many here have joined the fight? You joined the fight. So you're participating in this good warfare. That makes you a good soldier. But not the way the world does. Thankful for what? You talk about an oxymoron. How many preachers have you heard teach this? Well, you know what? You're going you're gonna to die and you're going to be shot at, you know, but, you know, you ask God for something else, maybe he'll fulfill, he'll fulfill that if you want something physical. How many preachers can you turn on and listen to that talks about this? How much of a crowd can you draw when you tell people you're going to get old and die? And you live long enough, you see that happening. And who would have the gall to come out and say, well, we're in the midst of a war here, but you should be peaceful in, inside and, and be thankful. You have participated in the war. It's a battle. The only way we make a difference is when we stay that way to help others. We not, might not be that way 24 hours in a day, but the overall teaching from Paul is that to be peaceful. And the only peace you can find today is internal. And we all know that. Thankful for what? For the opportunity to be in and part of this fight. Paul is our pattern. He says, I've fought a, fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. And, you know, he, 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 went, he did it until he died, until Nero killed him. Does anybody know what Rome, Genesis 16, 12 talks about? It talks about the animosity between Israel and Ishmael. And, and talking about Ishmael and his descendants, he says, it's going to be like a wild man. You can't tame him. In that country, in the Mideast there, there are Ishmaelites and Israelites. How do the Ishmaelites think and treat Israel? Like a wild man, they don't, they, you know, on their chest. You got to believe what I say. You have to believe, otherwise you're going to get your head chopped off. Do you know when that verse was written? Around 1911 BC. See, the one thing you get, and the only true history of the world, is that we need a savior. That is something you can take to the bank, so to speak. If you need anything more than the assurance of salvation, you are not a good soldier for the Lord. You got people that don't believe the Holocaust happened. Is that from 
Israelites or Ishmaelites? That's been documented. If words mean anything, like I said before, how come only the Bible, the Bible says the only gospel that can be um, made shipwrecked is Paul's gospel? Why would it say that? But the Lord says, join the good warfare, fight the good fight to become a good soldier. The Apostle Paul was absolutely certain of this truth, which if denied, you do so at your own risk. I think Fred quoted 2 Peter 3.16 on that. As a teacher, as a saint and the most high God, as, as a soldier, if you don't understand 2 Timothy 2.15, you're not the soldier. You're going to leave things out because you don't know the rest of the story. Many politicians and many pe- preachers pay lip service, telling people what they want to hear. Proverbs 29, verse 12 says, If a ruler hearkened to lies... All the servants are wicked. Now, this last last section, I really want you to think about. How many of you have ever heard of a sucking chest wound? Everybody know what a sucking chest wound is? I'll explain it in a minute. When I went in the Marine Corps at 18 years old, they got you buffalo. I don't trust any Marine that doesn't drink, smoke, and swear. That sounds pretty cool at 18 years old. I wish I could go back and try to figure out why I thought that back then. You know, I just, you know you're crazy. Well, that sounds pretty good then. But then, just two or three years later, a doctor told me, if you keep on doing what you're doing the way you're doing it, you're not going to live to see 30. Not so good. A sucking chest wound. It's a military term for a special kind of upper torso wound, usually combat related. It's called by a bullet or projectile going into that cavity. What happens to the person? When he breathes, he's breathing through that hole. He's not breathing through his mouth. You can't oxygenate the blood like it's supposed to be, and it doesn't last too long. How do you treat the wound? Well, there is one practical reason for smoking, because smoking, the pack of cigarettes had plastic in the outside. So you take that plastic, put it over this, what we're taught now, put it over that hole. If you're lucky enough to have tape, you tape both sides and the bottom. You leave the top side just to land against the skin, because he's, he's breathing in and breathing out. And if you look at that, that plastic, if you see it draw in when he's breathing, you know he made a good seal. Think about the space shuttle. If they get hit some metal rock, I mean, some rocks, and it breaks into the cabin, you got all the good thing gushing out, and inside is left nothing. You're empty. You, nothing, no profit. You can't breathe. You're going to die. This whole present world, present evil world, is nothing but a sucking chest wound enticing us to suck in all the garbage. Go to Ephesians 4. And while you're going there, let me read you a verse in Matthew 15. This people draw an eye unto me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctors the commandments of men. The word vain means empty, it's useless, worthless, having no substance, no value, no importance. Ephesians 4, 17 through 19. I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk as other Gentiles walk, <clears throat> excuse me, in the vanity of their mind. Their mind has become a vacuum, sucking in the garbage, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past Feeling. By the way, that's another word for seared conscience. Who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness 
to work all uncleanness with greediness. Notice it's all internal here. Psalm 94 says, The Lord knoweth the thoughts of men, that they are vanity, empty, useless. Psalm 49, if you want to go there. Psalm 49. I'm going to read you verses 10 to 13. Psalm 49. Did I say 39? Psalm 49. Starting at verse 10. Psalm 49, 10. For he seeth that wise men die. Likewise the fool and the brutus person perish. And leave their wealth to others. Their inward thought is. That their houses shall continue forever. And their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands. Even after their own names. Nevertheless. Man being in honor abideth not. He is like the beasts that perish. This their way is their folly, yet their posterity approve their sayings. The posterity is their descendants. The whole human race is the posterity of Adam and Eve. The Bible is the only true history of mankind. Romans 1 says, but because when they because that when they knew not God and glor- they glorified him, him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Anyone in government, just about, is incapable of telling the truth. Automatically, when someone assumes an elected position, their Pinocchio nose grows extremely long. (laughs) Their entire purpose is then to be all things to all people. I'm going to read you the verse that talks about this. In order to get reelected. This is why virtually no elected official has the backbone, nor any morals of principles, because if they had, telling the truth would make them unelectable. Now, aren't you glad we have 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, the only form of multi-level marketing? All right, no money involved here. Faithful men going out and training other faithful men. Here's what Paul says about that. 1 Corinthians 9, starting at verse 19. For though I be free from all men, Yet have I made myself servant unto all. That's that agape love mindset, esteeming others. Then am I gain the more. He's not talking about money. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew. Then I'm making the Jews. To them that are under the law is under the law. Then I might gain them under the law. To them that are without the law is without the law. Being, being not without the law to God, but under the law to Christ. Then I might gain them that are without the law. To the weak became as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be be partaker thereof with you. Goebbels, the Nazi propaganda ministry, time passed, he was an expert at manipulating the German people. And he said, If you tell a big lie often enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually believe it. The power of the Internet and other media has facilitated spreading news and propaganda to billions of people. And very few can distinguish if they hear or read real news or fake news. Let me give you some real news. In John chapter 8, What's Jesus Christ? What does he call the the Pharisees there? You're of your father, the devil. And the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of, of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. 1 John 5, 19 says, 
And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. I pastor a church in South Bend, Indiana, and I tell my folks all the time, all they can do is kill you. That's a broken record with me. Don't we have the victory? When you're absent from the body, who are you with? Do me a favor. Shoot me now. (laughs) That's how victorious we are. The only thing we have to worry about, that it might not be too painful, but once you're on that side, when this becomes your reality, if we get into a shooting war here, which might happen, Are you going to freak out? Are you going to pull your hair out? What kind of a witness are you going to be to your neighbors? Can you defend yourself? Yeah, you can. But what kind of a witness? We have neighbors. My wife is doing a Bible study through for the uh, summer right now. And she has a few girls, a few women there. And we sent out uh, five or six people, the neighbors in, in the neighborhood. And... They know we're Christians. They don't, uh, well, do you want to join the Bible study? Well, none of them wanted to, to do that. Um, we've been very good neighbors, so nobody has any complaints. Um, but you have to make the effort. We're sitting at, we went out to dinner, um, my wife and Lynn, who's here, a friend from high school, um, with another woman that they went to high school with. It was just a couple of weeks ago. And... Her husband's got something wrong with him. He's, you know, in his 60s and all that. And she's, uh, you know, 61. And we're sitting at the dinner table because when I saw them the day, or earlier in that day, we, I didn't bring it up because you don't want to get on people's nerves too quick. And so I said to Monica, I said, Monica, if you could know where you're going to spend eternity when you die. Now, this is textbook. Would you want to know that? Because no. Don't say anything more to a person that says that. You've planted the seed. You never know what's going to happen. Don't get him angry. All they can do is, script, is kill you. Scripture says we're going to die. It's pointed among the men wants to die. You try to keep the old body going as fast as much as you can. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to just kill the soul. But rather for him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Amen. Acts 9 1. Fred was talking about Saul before he came Paul. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest. In the same chapter, this is where we learn about something that the Lord kept secret just before the foundation of the world. It is this secret that gives us the knowledge and a need to stay in the fight. And to have peace at the same time. I hope I didn't offend anyone. But thank you for the time.